This week on TGC News, it's quite possibly the most jam-packed episode ever. SIG has a tiny pistol, PSA listens to Mac, new silencers, new guns, the struggle bus, and more. Keltec offers some of the most interesting and innovative firearms in recent memory. Whether you're into bullpup rifles like the RDB or RFB, or maybe the KSG bullpup shotgun in short or gigantic configuration. Or maybe you just want to plink around with some pistol caliber stuff like the Sub 2000 or PF9. They make something affordable for everyone. To learn more, check out KeltecWeapons.com. Welcome back to another episode of TGC News, the only gun news show that covers things you actually care about. My name is John Patton. Shout out to everyone watching this show from behind enemy lines in states like California, New Jersey, and New Yorkistan. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans. Another day closer to victory. Like I said in the opening, we have a lot to cover. So let's get to it. First up this week, Palmetto State Armory has re-released the AKV. For those unaware, the AKV is a 9mm AK that's essentially been modernized quite a bit and takes CZ Scorpion style magazines. It sells for just over 700 bucks. They were originally released in late 2018, but PSA found out pretty quickly that there were some issues afoot that needed to be addressed. This re-released version has a few much needed upgrades. First, they've flared the dust cover and turned it into a sort of over-travel stop for the safety lever. They've also done a better job attaching the dust cover to the rear sight so that it doesn't move. Inside the gun, they've added a recoil block and recoil buffer to stop the gun overrunning itself and causing feed issues. Timing is everything when it comes to semi-auto reliability and this aims to correct those issues. There's also a new cut on the bolt itself which is intended to act like sort of a, a shovel as the bolt is going forward to aid in getting spent casings out and away from the gun. Think of it as a moving brass deflector. And last but not least, they're adding something inside the receiver that they're calling the MAC bracket. This is named after Military Arms Channel. The reason for the bracket is that when Tim was clearing a malfunction, there was enough of a gap inside the fire control group that a spent case or even a spent live round could fall down inside and totally lock up the gun. The bracket is there to prevent that from happening. There are a couple things that stand out to me here as interesting. First, it's great to see PSA tackle the issues that came up in pretty quick fashion. It's only been a few months since the release of the gun and they've already got everything hopefully addressed. Beyond that, it shows that they are listening to the consumer and owned up to the issues. Not only that, but this to my knowledge is the first time that a gun company has named a part after a gun channel. I know for a fact that gun tubers can affect the outcome and designs of products quite a bit, but I've never actually seen a gun company come out and say, hey, not only did we fix this, but we're naming it after one of the people that found the problem. That for sure is a sign of the times. And the last thing that stands out to me here is that PSA has said that anyone with an older AKV will get the upgrades for free. So it's sort of a recall, it's sort of a redesign, and it's sort of a new gun. Call it an AKV firmware upgrade. Time will tell if those fixes solve the issues 100%. It gets me thinking. With a lot of gun companies, we see them try to sweep functionality issues under the rug and make them seem like eh, not really a big problem. But here we have a company willing to face the problems head on and own it. My question then becomes, do you guys at home trust a brand like PSA more because of this, or do you think they should have tested the gun more to begin with? Maybe the answer lies somewhere in the middle. Drop your thoughts in the comments section and let me know. Next up this week, we have something different that actually comes from a couple of gun writers. Jeremy and Chris from the website thetruthaboutguns.com have gotten together to form a new company called Black Collar Arms. Their main product, a tiny little bolt action chassis system called the Pork Sword. 
We've seen a ton of push towards pistols chambered in rifle cartridges over the last few years, and this is no different. However, it's the smallest chassis that I've laid eyes on. Instead of having a huge chunk of metal, basically all you have is that kind of essential center section and then Picatinny rails on either end to attach a brace or a forend. It's kind of a neat idea, and that has been bolstered by their new builder's kit. Essentially, all you would need here is a Remington 700 pattern action, and you'd be good to go. Included in their kits are the chassis, the BCA far end, yeah, that's what they call it, which is their minimalist way to attach things up front, an SB tactical brace, a pistol grip, and your choice of barrel. You have choices of caliber between things like a 10 inch 300 blackout, a 12 and a half inch 308, and my favorite, a nine inch 458 SOCOM. The barrels are from KAK, which means they're not super premium like proof, but they are definitely a solid barrel for the money. Prices on the build kits fall in around 700 bucks. Combine that with the price of a factory action and you're looking at around a grand all in for a tiny little bolt action pistol. To me, it's one of those things that just strikes me as fun. AR pistols are all the rage, right? Maybe this is the next step towards having fun in a different way. Also, consider the fact that you could use one of these tiny little bastards for hunting in areas where semi-autos aren't legal, but handguns are. Check your local laws, but either way, an all-around neat idea coming from guys that have lived and breathed the gun industry for a long time. In industry bus depot news, yeah, even more news this week, Smith & Wesson has announced that they will be moving their warehousing out of communist Massachusetts and into the new American Outdoor Brands, that's their parent company, new warehousing facility in Columbia, Missouri this year. In essence, they're consolidating all of their logistics into one centralized warehouse, which from my perspective, makes sense. It also comes around the same time as Missouri announcing that they will not be following federal gun laws, which is a very interesting thing altogether. Big Blue is saying that no one will lose their jobs because they'll be placed into other positions in Springfield. Keep in mind, this is just moving their warehousing, not the actual headquarters, which still is in Springfield, Massachusetts. I think that they will get a ticket to the not so struggle bus this week. Unfortunately for Hudson Manufacturing, they are not that lucky. On March 14th, they officially filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. This is likely the result of a long history of issues within the brand. First, it was supply chain issues. Then it was reliability issues on the guns themselves. Then customer service issues fixing those. And finally, financial issues. I've personally spent time with the Hudsons. I, I know them. They're good people, but clearly something wasn't being handled correctly under that roof. There's no telling what will happen to the guns that are already at their facility for warranty work, and that also means currently you can buy an H9 pistol for almost half of what they cost before. And in more struggle bus news, United Sporting Companies, the parent company for gun distributors Ellett Brothers, AccuSport, and Jerry's has announced that they will be consolidating their Pittston PA facility into their South Carolina and Ohio facilities. Boys and girls, this is the result of the leveling off that we've been talking about for a long time. Hopefully this consolidation will allow them to continue doing business. How about we pick up the pace with a little bit of rapid fire news. Magpul has recently announced the addition of a new drum magazine. They've come out with a plus size model of their D60 called the D50, which you guessed it holds 50 rounds of 762 by 51 ammo. That's going to cost you about 150 bucks, which is significantly less than an X Products drum mag and comes with 100% less anti-gun BS. Savage is expanding their line of hunting shotguns. As far as I know, their 212 and 220 bolt action slug guns are regarded as some of the best on the market. Well, they've taken those same guns, removed the rifling and created the 212 and 220 turkey guns. Prices are $695 for the 20 gauge and $779 for the 12 gauge. Not really sure if I would go with one of those over a pump or semi-auto, but it's always good to have options, right? CZ is expanding their line of silencers with the new Rimfire model. It's capable of handling Magnum Rimfire cartridges up to 224 diameter and weighs in at a modest two and a half ounces. There is no data on sound suppression besides offering a user-tunable baffle. Maybe that's a thing that TGC needs to get hold of for some testing. 
Pricing on those is $339, which is really not that bad. Also in Silencer News, Liberty has just announced the Infinity X, which is a rehashed version of their discontinued Infinity Silencer. According to them, it's got a lot of the same features and ratings as their popular Mystic X and comes in at about 3.7 ounces lighter because they're using a bunch of titanium. The price tag on this weighs in at $845, which is 200 more than the Mystic X currently. So $200 difference for under four ounces in weight savings. Hmm. On top of that, if you have an older Mystic, Infinity, or Mystic X, you can have them upgrade it to become an Infinity X for 450 bucks. They say this was created out of customer feedback, but I'm really struggling to figure out why it exists at all if the only difference is a few ounces in weight. It does exactly the same thing as far as being a multi-caliber can. I don't know, it seems weird to me. SIG has announced a new version of the MPX called the Copperhead. It's one of the weirdest guns to come out of a serious gun manufacturer in a while. Long story short, it's an MPX with a three and a half inch barrel. Yes, that is a shorter barrel than a Glock 19. I'm pretty sure this was cooked up by some alphabet soup agency requirement, but at a whopping $1,800 plus MSRP, I'm not sure it makes sense to any of us normies. And rounding us out on rapid fire is a new Ruger 1022 competition model. At first glance, I thought it was sort of a response to the performance center versions of the TCR 22, but the new Ruger has a lot more features packed in. On top of what you would expect, it's got an adjustable cheek rest, a BX25 trigger, an extended mag release, a fluted and threaded barrel with a muzzle brake, and a nice laminate stock. Pricing on that is at $899 MSRP, which puts it almost $300 higher than the TC Performance Center version. Time will tell how they compare. Birchwood KC's selection of shooting products is astounding. Whether you're looking for the best targets to zero your gun, or maybe you want to refurbish a forgotten classic, or maybe you just want to slam some steel and have a good time at the range. And don't forget that ear and eye protection. No matter what kind of shooter you are, Birchwood Casey has what you need. And because you watch TGC, they're going to help you out with a discount of 10% off your entire order when you use the code TGC10 over at birchwoodcasey.com. It's time now for more Friendly Fire, the segment where I answer your questions from all over the interwebs. And this week, our questions are coming from the TGC Nation Facebook group. Tons of you guys jumped in there for the Gun Channel poll, so I wanted to make sure you guys have a voice here on the show. First up, Cody May says, do you believe that teachers should be given realistic training for active shooters? abso freaking lutely Anyone in a school environment should be trained on how to handle those situations. Armed, unarmed, it doesn't matter. Everyone should be trained. Mark Travis wants to know if there will ever be a TGC range day. I would love to do that, but finding a place to do it in my area has proven tough. A lot of ranges don't allow for that sort of thing, or it's a range that I really don't feel comfortable partnering with. Options are pretty limited in this area, so if you guys have any ideas, lay them on me. Garrett Schneider says, what is the best fan encounter that you've ever had? I can't really think of a single best one. I remember early on that there was a guy that recognized me in a gas station in like the middle of nowhere in PA, and he was pretty excited. I was pretty excited about that. And then he sent me a super nice message afterwards, and it just, it was freaking cool. It was one of the earliest experiences that I remember. I also remember a guy at NRA one year that had to have his wife come over to get me so that they could have a picture. <laughs> It's like, dude, come on, you, 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 you can speak to me. You're an adult, I hope. <laughs> and of course, Richard, who comes over from the UK every year to NRAM. Really funny story, Richard's from the UK, and he made sure these were in inches and not measured. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Honestly, thinking of that, a lot of my favorite encounters have happened at NRAM events. It's incredible to be there and meet so many of you guys in one place. And speaking of that, the TGC panel announcement should be posted this week. If it's not already posted by the time this goes up, it'll be posted. My friendly fire question to you guys this week is based on a video I saw on YouTube by Lock Picking Lawyer. He took one of those identilocks, you know, you put your finger on there and it just falls away. He took one of those and broke into it in a mere eight seconds. So that makes me wonder, should you put a battery or a key between you and your home defense firearm? Keep in mind, I don't have kids at home, so I know the parents out there might have some different answers, but what if the battery on this thing fails? 
What if you can't get in? What if you're fumbling with the keys to get to your lifesaver? Maybe I'm missing something here, but I want to know what you guys think. Let me know in the comment section what your thoughts are on that. Also, there is a link in the description down below to check out the lockpicking lawyer video because it's pretty cool to watch how quickly he gets into that thing. And of course, if you want your question answered right here on the show, send it to me over on theguncollective.com. And that is it for this week's show, guys. If you disliked the video, hit that button. If you liked it, hit like, get subscribed. Consider supporting us via the links in the video description. Blah, 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 blah. There's links all over the place. You can buy a shirt. You can buy stuff on Amazon that supports us. You can buy stuff through affiliates. You can find us on social media. All that stuff, <laughs> as always. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you soon. The reason the bracket, the reason for the bracket, one more time. Yep, it sucks that this week's show is over, but don't worry, you can click on the video up top to watch last week's show, and the one down below that is the video YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. Check them out and let me know what you think.